Welcome to Curiosity Quest Goes Green, the show that explores what you, the viewer, are curious about. Now today our quest setter came to us from Linwood, California. Dulce wrote, Dear Joel, we're in the middle of a drought and I'm curious how many gallons of water we use and what we can do to be more water wise. Well Dulce, because of you, we're in a Southern California desert. We're gonna learn how they handle droughts and water conservation. So let's begin today's Curiosity Quest Goes Green. So we're up in the Mojave Desert, out here in the city of Apple Valley, and I'm here with Lance Eckhart. How's it going, man? Doing great, how you doing? So Lance, tell us a little bit about what you do and where we're at. Okay, I'm a groundwater scientist, and I work for the Mojave Water Agency, and basically manage the water supplies for about 5,000 square miles of high desert for almost a half million people. That seems like an enormous area, is it? It is an enormous area. It covers the cities of Barstow, Hesperia, Victorville, Yucca Valley, Phelan, El Mirage, Newberry Springs, Lucerne Valley, and all those communities that I just mentioned. So it's a pretty big area, diverse group of people. First of all, how does water get to all these places that are way out in these, these distant cities you're talking about? Well, we're in a desert, so there's not a lot of water to begin with. But, <laughs> okay. we, but it does rain here. We have a river, the Mojave River, that is dry most of the year but flows for tens and tens and tens of miles until it goes out in the middle of the desert and dries up. And that's our artery of water, our lifeline that the water comes in and soaks in the ground. That's our natural supply. We also have an unnatural supply of water. <laughs> okay, unnatural Un supply of water. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> it's really just water from Northern California. We have the ability to move water from Northern California to Southern California through the California Aqueduct and the State Water Project. This is part of why we're up here with you guys because there's all this talk about drought. I mean, it's been going on for a very long time, right? but it's getting louder and louder. And we're getting letters about this, this topic of drought. So we thought, let's go to a place that, at least in our minds, would know how to handle having little water. That's the desert. We're used to being in a drought because we live in a desert. So we're, it's normal for us. What are we gonna be seeing today? Cause I understand we're gonna be traveling all around the Mojave Desert. You're gonna see some native desert plant life and how we can incorporate it in our lifestyle. You're going to see some of our conservation activities. You're gonna see some of our scientists in action releasing water and recharging the aquifer, the water from Northern California. You're also gonna see how they measure groundwater monitoring wells and the water table and aquifer to determine how much water we have. Is this water conservation, water drought stuff? Is this rocket science? It's not rocket science, but it is science. It is science, okay. All right, so we have a busy day ahead of us. Lance, appreciate your time. My pleasure. All right, you bet. All right, let's head to the next location. Where is the Mojave River? Somewhere around the Mojave, I would assume. Where's the Mojave? It's in a desert. Southern California, and Arizona, and Nevada. You want to add any other states onto that, or are you good? Uh, I think I'll add Wisconsin. Of the desert, in the certain spot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here with Kirby, the general manager of the Mojave Water Agency. Kirby, where are we staying right now? We're in kind of in the middle of the Mojave River right now. I know a lot of people have asked me, and I'm sure they've asked you, do we have enough water to sustain ourselves? Yeah, that is the big challenge. And uh, I think one thing to emphasize is we knew this was coming. Okay. Uh, droughts come and go all the time in California and in different parts of the nation. So, the, so kind of the secret or the challenge of surviving a drought is being prepared for a drought. And actually, we're standing here at an outlet of uh, water that we get from Northern California. And so preparing for this drought was actions that we've taken over the last decade of taking as much water as available when it's wet, putting it in the river, and letting it seep underground and essentially storing it in a bank. 
So it's ready and available for times just like right now when we're in drought. This is a very unique thing that we're actually getting to see right now, right? Yes. And, and what do you call this? It's actually called a groundwater recharge facility. It's when we take supplemental water that we get from Northern California and we use that to augment our natural supplies. Our natural supplies come from the watershed up in, up in the river and when it storms and when it rains, that natural supply comes down and infiltrates underground in the river. So what we're doing here is we're replicating that actually from imported supplies that we have access to from Northern California and the Sierras. So how much water are we recharging the basin with right now? Right now, very, very little because okay. we're in a drought. So our supplies uh, this, this year and the past couple years have been very limited. How many times a year right now are you able to take this water? Um, probably several times a year, but okay. the quantities are, are, are very, very limited small, compared huh? to what they are when they're wetter, in the wetter years. So this isn't going to continue on for a week, is it? Pro uh, it'll probably continue on for a few weeks, then we'll be out of our allocation. We won't see anything for it for the next year or so. Now, I I'm just looking out, and I, I would imagine that if somebody were just to you know, drive by or, or a resident would see this and think, like, wow, we're wasting all this water. It's just pouring out pouring right on here. the ground yeah absolutely and incorrect that is strategically being placed underground and I think what you uh, what you have seen or will see we have a number of scientists on board that take water level measurements so we know exactly where where how much is going underground we yeah. know exactly where it goes we take water levels and it's all highly managed and a lot of people at home including you know me uh, you sit here and you think, wow, great, we have all this rain that just happened, and whew, we're out of a drought. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not, no. <laughs> so it's a relatively small amount of rain, and from a, from a California perspective, what's really important is not just the rainfall, it's also the snowpack. Okay. And the snowpack right now, I think, is hovering about 20, 30% um, um, of average. Wow. And I think it's uh, January, I think, was shaping up to be one of the worst years ever on record for the Sierras. So yeah, the Sierras are also like a big giant reservoir because it comes down in snow, it's held in snow, yeah. and it slowly trickles out in, into the reservoirs. So if it all came down at once and a whole bunch of rain, that's good, but it's not great. Because gotcha. a lot of that stuff actually comes down too fast and goes into the ocean. So what we really want and what California really needs is a good snowpack. In terms of rain, how many inches of rain does the high desert get in a given year? Well, the operative word there is desert. <laughs> so not much. Uh, <laughs> we get like about that, yeah. three or four inches. Not very much Water rain. is a precious resource for us. Wow. There's no doubt. And, and as we're seeing all over the nation and as definitely as we're seeing all over California, there's a growing understanding of how precious that limited resource is. Yeah. And it's very important that we have uh, the scientists and, and agencies like ourselves. We have kind of a saying around here is that you can't manage what you can't understand. Makes sense? It makes sense. Makes and, and you need sense. the people, you need the, 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 the kids that are coming up that are trained uh, in those disciplines to be able to uh, apply that knowledge so that future generations can do even a better job than we're doing right today. Kirby, thank you so All much. Right. I appreciate it. This is awesome. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Did you know an average person uses 55 gallons of water each day just inside their home? We're out here at Victor Valley College and I'm here with Neville. Neville, first of all, what do you do here at Victor Valley College? Well, I have a lot of fun, I can tell you that. I, I teach probably the most exciting area, very dynamic. You know, we've got all these green careers and we know we're running out of natural resources. So I actually teach agriculture and natural resource management. So it's a pretty new field in that we, we don't have any traditional programs at many four-year schools that do that. I remember Kirby saying uh, earlier when we talked to him uh, how important it was to build up the next generation yep. Of, of scientists and mathematicians that can help us figure out what we need to do to move forward. Yeah, we do. In fact, I would just point to this uh, experiment here. This is growing a, a na native grass called panic grass. Students are doing applied research here. They're testing different seed treatments, different soils to grow this so that we can rehabilitate or restore the Mojave watershed where we are busy as a community conservation project removing the, the tamarisk. It's an invasive species that's taken over the native habitat. At any given semester, how many students will you have going through this program? 
We have a, a wide variety of classes, 28 classes, and so we can have 500 students. Not all wow. of them are hooked in, Yeah. but the beauty of it is we've designed it so they can cross over because this field, we need those political science students that come down because the policy stuff is so critical. Yeah. How does this fit into California's uh, water plan? How does this fit into our water quality acts and all those kinds of things? And then we need the economic side. So we've got this lovely cross-pollination between programs here on the campus. I mean, I'll just ask you an obvious question, like what would this have to do with water? How does this and water intersect? Yeah, so um, when we look at Managing water, as we know, there's nothing more critical to us in California, our econo economy and everything else. This is looking at a watershed scale. So we look at the whole watershed, and we've had tremendous pressures on our watersheds from fires, from invasive weeds, from building. So we need to restore that habitat, that watershed, so that it retains water, it's healthy, it's a habitat for all the birds. We, for example, right here have a massive migration route coming right through this valley. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a whole balanced approach to where we keep the watershed healthy, that keeps our water supply healthy, which in this area, we're amazing enough, we're in a desert, but we've got one of the most stable watersheds because and, and groundwater supplies because it's so well managed. What's a watershed? If I have a mountaintop, whatever flows one way, and I'm on this side, that's my watershed. It's wherever the water sheds to. So it's these very big areas that, where, where water goes towards, and that's how we choose to manage things on a broader scale. What is a watershed? That would be like a place where you store water, I guess. A watershed is a type of source of water. A watershed is a big area of land that has water on the inside. A watershed is a body of water under the grounds. All right, I'm here with Matt. Matt, tell us, where are we right now? We are on the side of the Mojave River, right across the community of Jess Ranch at one of our key monitoring wells, Mojave River Well, monitoring well number three. How many wells do we have throughout the valley? The Mojave Water Agency service area, we have about 409 key wells that we monitor. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. And this- 409! Actually, at this spot, we have about 11 wells just in this one vault. It's about 1,100 feet deep. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And it's just literally right off of the, the river right here, yeah. right? Yeah. All I'm seeing is dirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's typical. It's the Mojave River is, flows perennially, which means that it flows seasonally. Okay. Um, when there's big rainstorms, you'll see water flowing, and then it may be dry all summer, but there's still a large aquifer underneath us with an abundance of water. So we're gonna actually open this up yeah. and check it out, huh? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right, let's get to it, man. He's gonna hit it, hit it. Oh, oh, wow. Sometimes you just need to break it loose. Well, okay. I wish I could report that this is something so deep and incredibly, I thought it was like way down. No, oh, no, no. I mean, no, for safety for, for safety reasons, we don't have just an 11 foot hole in the ground. What are we checking for today? Um, today, we're gonna be sampling this the, the smaller two inch development development casing right here. Okay. Um, that we sample for 51 analytes, and those would be your common metals like um, aluminum, arsenic, chromium, total dissolved solids, nitrates. Collect the sample, and that's the whole science of the sample band behind us is collecting um, defensible water quality data. There yeah. really is a lot of science. Oh yeah. A ton of science to this, right? Yeah, d definitely, definitely. Why would you monitor a water well? Uh, to make sure it doesn't overflow. Uh, to make sure like the water levels are okay, to make sure like the levels aren't too like poisonous, aren't too like, there's not too much lead in it and whatsoever, so make sure it's healthy. To check on like, you know, if it's contaminated or not. Don't want it to get too low in case there's a crisis. To monitor the water's quality uh, for pollutants or other infectants. Because we might run out of water. What is the main reason for monitoring the wells? Um, the main reason for monitoring all, all the wells that we have is so that we can make scienti scientific based decisions of, on our aquifers and for our large projects. So to know how much water you have and the quality of that water. Exactly. Okay. Oh, so we're actually putting something down now. Yeah. It's like big, huge tape measure. And this is a 500 foot reel. Wow. We have wells that are 
the water levels are greater than 500 feet. It's so crazy that we're just dropping it straight down in the earth. That's amazing. 64.96. You're literally sticking it in the van. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a, it's a complete controlled environment inside the van. Well, if you top right up in here. Okay, I'm gonna head on inside the van here, check this out. So you said this is the well that we're looking at right now. Yeah, this is the well right outside right outside the sample van, and we're sampling the, developing ca the development casing right here. So let's fire it up, let's bring fire some up. water up. Okay. So. so once you have all of the data collected, you're, are you still going to take samples back to another lab? Yes. Okay. So that ensures that the three volumes have been removed, so what we're actually getting is fresh aquifer water, mm -hmm. not water that has been sitting in that stand in the, in the pipe. All right, Matt, we got to move on. Yeah. You got to take your water sample to the lab. Yep. And we're out. Let's go to the next yeah. location. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Hey, check this out. It takes approximately 6,000 gallons of water each year to maintain an average sized lawn. We've made our way out here to Barstow Community College. I'm here with Nick. Nick, what are we standing on? We are standing on a former grass area. This all used to be turf and grass. Uh, Barstow Community College has taken advantage of our Cash for Grass program. And basically what our Cash for Grass program is, is we pay people to remove the turf that they had here and give them a rebate, uh, helping to save water. Do you have like any idea how many gallons, how much water? What are we talking about? The total project they're doing here is 123,000 square feet. And if we equate that to gallons, that'll be 70,000 gallons of water per year that they save. That seems like an awful lot of water. It is actually. Wow. And in the grand scheme of things, our total cash for grass program, we've done 7 million square feet to date, which is about 3.9 million gallons of water. Because I've heard about cash for grass for a, a long time. I mean, how do people take advantage of it? What's the process? How does it work? Um, our programs are run through our local water agencies. So people contact their water agency. The, the contact person comes out, measures the turf area. Yeah. Uh, they accept them into the program. After they complete the program, then somebody from our office goes out and does a visual check, making sure that they've followed all the rules, done all the things they need to do, have converted the uh, sprinkler system to a drip irrigation system. They're not putting any perm impermeable materials in the ground. They're only putting in something that's going to accept the water into the aquifer. We don't like concretes. We don't like plastics. You know, anything that's going to make the water run over the top, we don't want that. We want the water in the ground, in our aquifer. I, I don't know if you can give us like, like a comparison. The grass, the turf that was here, mm -hmm. you know, I know you've said 70,000 gallons of water per sure. year, but I mean, like, I'm just curious, like, in terms of how many times uh, a week you would have to water that versus how much is being watered now? Let me put it to you this way. For each square foot of grass mm -hmm. in our area, due to the hot, the, the hot temperatures and the amount of water loss we have here, each square foot takes about 75 gallons per year to grow. 75 gallons. I'm just thinking about milk jugs and stack them all the milk jugs. So 75, 75 milk jugs is going to grow in, in a one square foot. In a so square foot is, is, is. We're talking about, well, I'm making it bigger than it is, right? It's actually, if you took that and squared that off, that is one square foot. Square foot. Okay. Wow. Uh, and, and, and when you convert, you save 55 gallons. So you're only go, you're going down to about 18 gallons per square foot by doing a conversion like this. Wow. So it's, it's, I don't know, do the quick math, the 65% uh, savings on the yeah. amount of water. And outdoors is where we can see the greatest amount of water conservation. Sure. What is an aquifer? An aquifer is an underwater water containment system that is built into the rock. Pretty much like a water current? An aquifer is like one of those big tanks that you see that like processes water. Where they keep water. A source of water. <laughs> that is located Underground. All right, we're inside the Mojave Water Agency, and I'm here with Tony. Tony, what, what, you didn't bring me a drink? What, what's going on here? What is this? What, what is that, this? That is an aquifer in a cup. An aquifer in a cup? Yes, I made, I made that myself. <laughs> yeah, there's water in here. <laughs> yes, there's water in there. So I'll give that back to you. You don't have to drink that, do you? Yeah, oh, you do. Okay. Sure, why not? <laughs> okay. So is this like an example of what we were learning about? Today? Yeah, this is, this is an example. This is a little tiny aquifer in a cup. So groundwater is the water between the dirt spaces, between the gravel pieces beneath our feet. So to kind of help you visualize that, we have a cup full of gravel and 
just to prove that there's water in there. There's oh, water in there. Yeah, I, I got he some water did it. The I, I didn't pour it out here. <laughs> okay. So there's water in there. So in the in the high desert, in this area especially, uh, we are pretty much 100% reliant on groundwater. So when you turn on the tap, when you go to the drinking fountain, <laughs> you're sucking it out, huh? Yeah. yeah, that's right. I know this is on everyone's mind. We've, we've talked to several people about it today. Are we running out of water? That is a wonderful question. <laughs> that's what everybody keeps uh, <laughs> saying. But, but what's the answer? The answer is no. Okay. But we have to keep a watch on it, you know. I'm not saying everything's perfect, yeah. but we're actually in pretty good shape, all things considered. Now, if the drought continues for another five years, it might be panic time. But okay. for, for right now, we're fine. All those measurements that we have taken today, what do you do with all that stuff? This is what we call a hydrograph map. Okay. So, so we take those water levels that get measured and we plot them up. How are we doing and, and compared to past droughts or you know the past decades? That That is a great question. For example, if you had a well that you got your water out of and you measured it maybe say last year, and then this year you measure it again, Ooh. oh my gosh, it's way down, it's, it's down. time to panic, right? Yes. Well, you look back at the history and you're like, you know, we've been here before. In fact, we've been worse before and then it's come back, it's come down and it's gone back. And this depends on climate cycles, on, you've heard about artificial recharge. That's, yes. that's one of the things that goes in here as well. What can we do? Really the most important thing that you can do is, is awareness, understand the situation. As more and more people become aware, it'll, it'll lead to a, a cultural shift in behavior, uh, a conservation-minded attitude, and that's really the main thing, is that, is that cultural attitude of water efficiency, water conservation really kind of sinks into the, to the population at large. That is probably the number one thing that's gonna help out as far as maintaining and, and conserving this precious resource. If there's any good thing that a drought does, I think it's that right there. Yeah. We're all becoming more and more aware. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Just by turning off your faucet, when you are brushing your teeth, you can save more than 10 gallons of water. All right, so we're out in Pioneer Town, and I'm here with Robin Cabali. Now, Robin, first question I have for you is, where is Pioneer Town? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where are we? We are uh, at the edge of the Mojave Desert, mm -hmm. and Pioneer Town, the little town that grew up out of a movie set in the 1940s for the cowboy movies that you can still see in black and white today. Oh my. That little movie set is just a couple miles away and it has now sprung into a little town center. We're out here because there are plants that had figured out over time how to conserve water and how to do it in a sustainable way. The biggest problem and the biggest challenge for every plant here is trying to keep enough water to survive. Okay. So if we want to find out how to conserve water, all we have to do is look at the plants and they've already, they've already done it. So if you look at all the leaves, look how small they are. They're really, they're really tiny leaves. You don't see any big leaves. Yeah. That saves water. And it saves water because they stay cooler if they're smaller. And if you're cooler, you don't have to pant or sweat to cool off. Yeah. You stay cooler if you're smaller and that saves water. So all the leaves are small. But below ground, these, every plant that you see here, what you see above ground, and you say this is, this is maybe about three feet tall. Yeah. There's at least three times that in roots going down. So the roots on this will probably go down at least nine feet, but probably more like 12 feet. Wow. Yes. So are, are they go straight down? Are they spread out? That's a great question. They're <laughs> both. Oh, wow. There's little ones that come up near the surface because if it rains a little bit, they try to get those. But most of the roots go way down around what's called a tap root. And it's tapping down into layers of sand that may have been wet from a rainstorm 10 years ago. Wow. And that's how oh they, this, this has just lived through three years of the worst drought that we've ever had here. Yeah. It's green, yeah. <laughs> it's growing. Obviously using water smart, conserving it when we don't have it, like in a drought, like right now. Right. We have to make really smart choices, like the trees have to make choices. Sometimes a choice is if I'm going to live through this drought, I'm going to have to let a couple of my limbs die. Okay. And that's how I'm going to get through it. And we have to make choices like if we're going to get through this drought, maybe I'm not going to water my lawn as often. Yeah. You know, or maybe I need to put that other water saver 
shower head on and, and get the toilet that's a water saver. And those are choices we make to help get us through the drought because we want to be survivors yeah. like this. And these plants are all actually taking care of each other as well. They are partners in this drought and they're underground root partners that are actually helping them collect water. They're sharing water and resources the whole way. So if one is a big water hog, it's gonna hurt all of its neighbors. And so just like us, <laughs> wow. we don't wanna be a water hog in our street because it's gonna hurt all of our neighbors. Yeah. So we need to really think about every drop and be survivors like this and care about our community like these plants are, caring about their plant community. Wow. Fun fact, fun fact, fun fact. Here's your fun fact. Using a dishwasher versus washing dishes by hand can save you approximately 20 gallons of water per load. I want to thank everyone involved in today's show and for helping us learn what our role in a drought is and for teaching us that conservation is not necessarily rocket science. And I especially want to thank you, Dulce, for sending us on today's Curiosity Quest Goes Green. Now, if there's something you want to know more about, let me hear from you. Go to curiositychest.org, click on the Send Us On A Quest link, and simply tell me what you're curious about. And who knows, it might be you that sends us on our next green adventure. Now remember, this is our planet, and it's our responsibility to take care of it. So I'm curious, have you gone green? I'm Joel Green, I'll see you next time. How old would something like that be? That's, this is a granddaddy. If you look at the base here, mm -hmm. this is one where if we took a core bore, we pulled out and we counted the rings, yeah. we would probably be able to count I would say that this tree is probably about 800 years old. This is a pinion pine. What? Yes. 800 years old yes. in the middle of the desert with yes. no water? 